So I've got the recording started and I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully you guys can both see my screen. Yes. All right. So I will yes. just perfect. Sometimes I have little flashes. That's just and if you see flashes, that's just me switching behind between my screens. <laughs> so, so, all right. So I'm going to get started here. So um, this session is on multiplying and dividing with real numbers. And so I wanted to start with basically what is a real number? So the num any, if you think of a number, that is a real number, basically. So any negative numbers, positive numbers, and zero, those are all considered real numbers. Zero is not positive or negative. So it's not, it doesn't really have a sign. So that's why that is separated out um, from the negatives and the positives. When we um, just look at numbers, we have a number line. And so the negatives are to the left of zero, and then the positives are to the right. And the farther right you get, the larger the number is. The more you go to the left, the smaller the number is. And it sort of forms a mirror image with the, the positive and the negatives. So um, we're doing, I'm, I'm going back to the very basics here. So we've got the definition of multiplication. So multiplication is repeated addition. Now in this class, we don't use the X for multiplication anymore. Um, you'll see it occasionally in the homework problems in like the first chapter. But once you start getting into algebra, basically that X disappears and we use a dot. So the, a little dot just means multiplication because we don't want to use the X anymore. Sometimes what you'll see is like a little asterisk. So if you're trying to type math on your computer, um, there's an asterisk symbol and you can use that also to indicate multiplication. So we don't use the X anymore. So on my example, I have two dot five. So that's meaning two times five. And so multiplication is just repeated addition. So you can interpret this two different ways. You can think of two times five as two um, added five times. So there's five twos added together. Or it's also the same thing as doing five plus five, so you're adding, you have five added twice. So you can interpret it either way and you get the same answer. Next is division. So uh, this definition of division is helpful when you get into the order of operations to help you understand the order of operations. So division is defined as multiplying by the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of a number is just if you flip it over, so this is something that I talk about in my 1.1 video on fractions. Basically, if you have a whole number like 2, if we turn it into a fraction, we can write that as 2 over 1. And then the reciprocal is just flipping that so that it's 1 over 2. So a reciprocal is just flipping the top and the bottom if you wrote the number as a fraction. So if you have division, like 10 divided by 5, whatever's after the division sign, you can flip and multiply by the reciprocal. And that's actually a, a phrase we use a lot when you're, when you're dividing fractions. When you're dividing fractions, we say you multiply by the reciprocal. Because that is what the definition of division is. Um, usually, we don't use that definition of division unless you're working with fractions. But knowing that division is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal helps when we do the order of operations. Because in the order of operations, you can do multiplication or division in either order because they, can't, they basically are, can be defined the same way as multiplication. So I actually talk about that in my order of operations video. But I just wanted to kind of demonstrate um, just what division is. So if you have 10 divided by 5, that gives you 2. That's the same as doing 10 times 1 fifth. 
Because if on the right side, when you're multiplying fractions, a whole number times a fraction, you multiply the whole number times the top of the fraction. So that would be 10 times 1, which is 10, over 5. And then you can reduce that by dividing 5 from both. So if you divide 5 out of 10, you get 2. And 5 divided by 5 is 1. And so you get 2 over 1, which is equal to 2. So you get the same answer whether you just do 10 divided by 5 or you treat it like a fraction. So we're not going to use this a lot except if you were doing things with fractions, but I just want to demonstrate that definition. Do you guys have any questions so far? Yeah, I'm following you. No, uh, Stanley, did you say no or yes? I, I couldn't quite catch that. No, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it. Oh, oh I, uh, okay. My, okay. My sound went out. Ah, okay. Okay. So now we're going to get, now we're getting into the actual stuff that you need to know, multiplying and dividing with negatives. I'm sure you guys can do multiplication and division with whole, with like positive numbers. That most people, you know, you can do that. Even if you use a calculator, if you don't remember, if you don't have them memorized, you at least know how to do it. Right. With negatives, that's usually where it throws people off. So we have two basic rules. If you have a whole bunch of things multiplied or divided all in a row, you can count how many negative signs you see. If you have an even number of negative signs, like two, four, six, eight, you usually don't have that many, but if you have an even number of negative mm -hmm. signs, then your answer when you do the multiplication or division is always going to be positive. Okay. If you have an odd number of negative signs, like one, three, five, seven, or so on, when you multiply those or divide those, you're going to get a negative number. So you can determine whether answer is going to be positive or negative just by counting how many negative signs you see. Usually we only have two numbers multiplied together. So in my box here, if you're only dealing with two numbers, if you have a positive number times a positive number, you stay with a positive number. But because of this rule, if you multiply two negatives together, you also get a positive. So a negative times a negative equals a positive. And this is because a negative is the same as thinking about having the opposite of something. Okay. So if you think of a negative also meaning opposite. So if, you're take, if you have a negative number, it's an opposite, you're multiplying it by another negative, you're taking the opposite again. It's like you have two opposites, they cancel out, and that's how we end up with a positive. Okay. When you have an odd number, like a positive times a negative, you have one opposite in there, so your answer is negative. You're basically making the positive be opposite. And a negative times a positive is also negative. So it doesn't matter the order there, you're going to get up with, end up with a negative. So another way is if I just wrote a positive times a positive equals a positive. Negative times negative equals a positive. You can kind of think of those two negatives. You can put them together to make a plus sign, you know, if you rotated one of them. And let's see, we've got a positive times a negative is a negative. And a negative times a positive is a positive. Or, oops, that's not a positive. <laughs> negative. <laughs> Don't want to confuse you guys there. So those are the basic rules when we're multiplying and dividing with negatives. So I'm going to just start with some basics here. Um, and the one on the right, I'm definitely going to need a calculator. Most of these... I tried to pick ones that I can do in my head, but I have a typo and I wrote 26, which I did not intend to write, so I'm going to need a calculator for that one. <laughs> I can't do that in my head. <laughs> 
So the first example here, we have a negative three times four. And you know it's a negative number because it's in parentheses. So it's in parentheses, so we're not reading this like a subtraction because we use the same symbol for subtraction as we do as a negative. But if it's in parentheses like this, all by itself, that's indicating it's a negative. So we have one negative sign here. So our answer is going to be negative. So I can just write a negative. And then you can ignore the signs and do 3 times 4. So 3 times 4 is 12. And I know that it's going to be negative because I have one negative sign. So that gives me a negative 12. Now, if I move to the one on the right where I'm multiplying by negative 26, <laughs> I have two negative signs there. So two negative signs, that's even. So those are going to cancel out. My answer is going to be positive. So I'm going to just ignore the negative signs because I know I'm going to get a positive, And then I do 5 times 26, which I'm doing on my calculator. And that comes out to 130. And you can always check these on your calculator. The reason why I teach these rules, even though you can use a calculator, is because sometimes you may accidentally enter it in your calculator wrong. And so knowing whether your answer is supposed to be positive or negative can help you spot those mistakes. Because if you did one of these, like if you did negative 5 times negative 26 and you ended up with a negative number, you could look and be like, wait, I'm supposed to get a positive. So that kind of indicates, let me double check what I entered in. Bottom left, I have 8 times 6. So those are both positive numbers. So my answer is going to be positive, And 8 times 6 is 48. So that just gives me 48. And then bottom right, I have a positive times a negative. So there's one negative sign. So I'm going to have a negative answer. And then I just do 8 times 6, which is 48. For each of these problems, the way um, we show math once we start going into algebra, you don't do this so much normally with arithmetic, but once you start working with algebra, we go down. So we write our stuff underneath. And when there's more than one step, then you're going to have multiple steps, and you're going to keep going to you're gonna work down. OK. So that's an, a new thing that um, normally you would probably just write equals and then put the answer. But once we start working with multiple steps, we want to start getting into the, the habit of writing it mathematically so you can communicate. And, um, you know, there's standards. They're like a grammar. Um, you know, English has its rules about how things are written. Math also has its rules. <laughs> okay. So are there any questions on any of these four examples here? Not yet, not from me. OK. So next, I have division here. So I wanted to split these up. So first one, top left, I have negative 20 divided by 3. So I have one negative sign, so I'm going to have a negative answer. And then I do 27 divided by 3. So uh, that gives me 9. So this will be a negative 9 for your answer. Top right, I have two negative signs. A negative and a negative, those are even. Even number, 2 is even. So those cancel out, and I'm going to end up with a positive answer. Now. 21 does not divide by 16. If you did 21 divided by 16 on your calculator, you get a decimal. So what we're going to do is actually rewrite this as a fraction. So if on your calculator you get a decimal number and it doesn't come out to a whole number, then you can turn it into a fraction. The first number is always on top, and then the number after the division sign is in the bottom, the denominator there. So this would be 21 over 16. Then you would see if you could reduce the fraction, because you always try to reduce the fraction if possible. Now 21 is 3 times 7, and 16 is 4 times 4. So they don't have any numbers in common, 
So this one doesn't reduce. And so our answer is actually going to be a fraction, 21 over 16. Now, bottom left, I have 7 divided by negative 77. So I have one negative sign, so my answer is going to be negative. And if you did 7 divided by 77, you have to make sure you put it in your calculator in the correct order. We go from left to right. You get a decimal. And so I'm also going to write this one as a fraction. But first I'm going to write my negative sign because I have an odd number of negative signs. I just have 1. And then I have 7 over 77. Now I want to look, can I reduce this number? Do they have a number in common? Well, I can divide 7 out of both of these. So I'm, when I'm reducing fractions, this is the one time that I actually do go to the right. So, and I always show that I am reducing by writing what I am dividing out of my fraction so that it's clear and I can go back and check my work. So I can divide the top and the bottom by 7. And I, when I do that, I still get a negative answer. So I still have to have that negative. Then 7 divided by 7 is 1. And 77 divided by 7 gives me 11. So my answer in this case is going to be negative 1 over 11. OK. Now, bottom right, we just have both positive numbers, so our answer will be positive. And we do 25 divided by 5, which is 5. So any questions on any of those four examples? Not from me. Okay. I don't think I've seen anything in the, the chat box yet, so... Uh -uh. All right. <laughs> I just need to, you know, keep my eye on that. Okay. Now we do have some special rules when things are involving zero. And zero is, this is where most people start getting confused, is when you're, you're multiplying and dividing with zero. So we have three basic things that you need to remember. If you are multiplying by zero, you will always get zero back. So I have here the letter A. In algebra, a letter basically is, stands in for a number that we don't know what that number is. It can represent anything. So we're just using A because it's the first letter of the alphabet. And so where I have A times 0 equals 0, that's just saying that any number times 0 gives me 0. So it just can stand in for any number. So it doesn't matter what the number is. You're always going to get 0 out if you have zero involved in the multiplication. It doesn't matter the order of the zero. As, as long as you're multiplying and zero is there in the multiplication somewhere, then your answer is zero. When we're dividing by zero, that means zero is after the division symbol. So um, this could be a divided by zero, or you can see it written as a fraction where zero is in the denominator of the fraction. So if zero is after the division symbol or in the denominator of fraction, we can't do that. So this is called undefined. So your answer, you would just write the word undefined. And what that means, undefined means that our definition doesn't make us clear what the answer is. That's all that means. So um, it's just something, and when you do this on your calculator, like if you do 1 divided by 0, your calculator will tell you error. So, you, But you don't want to write down error. You want to actually write down the word undefined. My calculator actually tells me divide by 0. Like it tells me what the error is, which is kind of nice. Um, and then the third rule is zero divided by anything. So if zero is on the top of a fraction, or if zero is before the division symbol, then your answer is zero. So basically, if you're multiplying or dividing with zero, it's always going to be zero unless it's in the denominator or after the division symbol. So that is like the one 
special case where it's not zero. And so that is this, this last case right here. So that's just something that, uh, just a rule that you want to memorize. So I've got some examples here. So on the top left, I have zero divided by negative four. So the zero is before the division symbol. So that means my answer is zero. Zero divided by any number is zero. And zero doesn't have a sign. So even though I have one negative there, and you would think, okay, my answer is going to be negative, but zero, there is no such thing as negative zero. It's just zero. So when zero is involved, ignore the signs. Top right, we have zero after the division symbol. So it's after the division symbol, your answer is undefined. Again, it doesn't matter what the signs are because it's special because zero is involved. Bottom left, I have multiplication. Now with multiplication, it's easy because as soon as you have zero, your answer is zero. So negative seven times zero is zero. And then on the right, zero times 10, that is also zero. So it doesn't even matter what the number is. I just see, oh, I have multiplication and zero. My answer is zero. Are there any questions? Not for me. All right. Now let's look at special rules with one because one is another special one. We basically have two rules here. If you're multiplying by one, you get the same answer, same thing you started with. So any number times one results in itself. And it's the same thing with dividing. Dividing by one doesn't change anything. You end up with the same thing that you started with. One likes to keep things the same, and we use this property of one a lot when we're working with equations. So on the top left, 12 divided by one. So if you're dividing by one, if one is after the division symbol, it's always going to be whatever number is before the division symbol. So it's going to be 12. Um, I don't have an example here, but if one was on the other end, that actually gives you a fraction. So it's only when one is in the denominator or after the division symbol that you end up with the same, the, the, the number is unchanged. So top right, I'm negative six divided by one. So divided by one doesn't do anything. So I'm just left with negative six. And it's, it's consistent with our rules of positive and negatives. We have one negative sign and so we have a negative answer. Now if I had something like say negative six divided by a negative one, in that case, the two negatives would cancel out because um, you have an even number of negative signs and you'd actually get a positive out. So if you're dividing by negative one, the sign of whatever you have changes. It basically multiplying by negative one or dividing by negative one can change the sign. If it's multiplying by one or dividing by one, it stays the same. So, so bottom left, I have negative seven times one. So multiplying by one doesn't change anything and my answer is negative seven. Now if I had negative seven, times negative one, then that changes the sign and I end up with positive seven because the two negatives give you a positive. Then bottom right, one times 10. So anything times one is itself, that gives me 10. Are there any questions? Nope. All right. Now, exponential expressions. So working with exponents. 
this may be something that you're not too familiar with. So an exponent symbolizes repeated multiplication. Basically, the number that is in the exponent, and we call the exponent the, the superscript. So let me just write an example. So we label this. The small number on the top right, that is called the exponent. And if you are typing, like if you're Microsoft Word and you're trying to get something up there, it is called a superscript. That's how you get above the number and kind of smaller. So that number in the exponent tells us how many times we're multiplying. So if you have something like two to the four, that tells you you're multiplying four times. And then the number part, the big number, is what number is getting multiplied. So two to the fourth, which is another way, we'll, we say this out loud as two the, like two to the fourth. Um, special ones, if it's a two, it's two squared. If it's a three, we say that is cubed, but otherwise it's two the, and then the number. Um, but two to the fourth would be two times two times two times two. So you have four twos multiplied together. So that's how that, that works with an exponent. So it's repeated multiplication as opposed to multiplication being repeated addition. So because it's multiplication, we can follow the same rules of multiplying. So if you have an exponent that's even, and let's say the number that you're multiplying uh, that's under the exponent, so to speak, is negative, you're going to get a positive answer because you'll have an even number of negative signs when you write it out. If it's an odd exponent and it's on a negative, your answer is negative because you will end up with an odd number of negative signs when you multiply it out. So I've put this in a box. You would have your negative number in parentheses. And if it's an even exponent, your answer will be a positive number. And if it's an odd exponent, your answer is a negative number. Are there any questions uh, on the, like the definitions or kind of how this is working? Not for me. Nothing here. OK. Perfect. Um, now, before I go into some examples of these, I did want to also cover 0 and 1. So exponents involving 0, 0 is in the exponent, or 0 is under the exponent. So if 0 is under the exponent, you always get 0 out because you're multiplying by 0. So I have A again representing any number. So it doesn't matter what number is in the exponent. If 0 is on the bottom, the big number, you get 0. Now, this is an interesting rule. Number two is really interesting. If you have a number and the exponent is zero, you get an answer of one. So, like, I have a here, but it could be any number. Like, if I have two and my exponent is zero, the answer is one. And you can even test that out on your calculator. Now, if you're trying to do these on your calculator, depending on your calculator, um, there might be different symbols. My calculator uses the caret symbol to indicate an exponent. So if I were to type that in my calculator, or if, even if you want to type it like in a computer, you would use that little caret symbol that's on the keyboard. It's actually above the number six, and that is what we use to indicate exponents. So zero in the exponent always comes out to one. I'll go into why that is later in the course when it really becomes important, but I just wanted to put that rule here. And then if you have zero under the exponent and in the exponent, so if zero is in both places, it's undefined. And the reason is because if zero is in the bottom, we get zero. But if zero is in the top, we get one. So if it's in both places, is your answer zero or one? Well, we don't know, so we just say it's undefined because it's sort of a contradiction there. It can't be both.
Now, when you have one, um, this, there's only two basic things to think about. One to any number always gives you one because you're just multiplying by one, one times one times one, however many times, it's still one. Um, if one is in the exponent, then it doesn't do anything. You just end up with the same thing that you started with. So um, this second rule we use a lot when we start getting into algebra, when we start getting into things that are called like quadratics and exponential expressions. So that is going to pop up when we start getting into week four. When we get to week four, we'll start, we'll talk more about that. But basically, if there's an exponent of one, it's the same thing as not having an exponent at all because it doesn't do anything. Okay, so some examples here, and I've included negatives here because that's usually where people get tripped up. So top left in parentheses is negative 10, and then I have a two in the exponent, and that's red squared. So if there's a negative inside the parentheses with an exponent that's even, our answer is positive. So I'm gonna get a positive answer, and you can do 10 squared, which is 10 times 10. So you can think of this as doing the same thing as 10 times 10, which is 100. So in parentheses, negative 10 squared gives you a positive 100. Now, top right, we don't have parentheses. If there is no parentheses, then we assume that that negative is not included. So I only have one negative symbol. It's not part of the exponent. So this kind of looks as like you're saying negative and then you're doing 10 times 10. So in this case, we get a negative 100 as an answer. And the difference between these two answers are basically whether there's parentheses around the negative or not. That is the big difference in these answers. This is where people always go wrong when they're doing something on your calculator. So most people will be trying to do the one on the left, but in their calculator, they will type the one on the right and then get the wrong answer because they didn't type it in the calculator correctly. So the parentheses are very important because they change your answer completely. Are there any questions on those two examples before I move on to the next ones? Not for me. Nothing here. Okay. Now, bottom left, one to the third power. So it doesn't matter what number is in the exponent. If one is underneath it, we always get one. Now, bottom right, I have a negative inside. So it's a negative two. And then my exponent is three, which is an odd number. So a negative with an odd exponent will give me a negative answer. So this is going to be negative, and then what I'm doing is 2 times 2 times 2, because we have a 3, which means it's being multiplied 3 times. So if you do that, 2 times 2 times 2, first 2 times 2 is 4, and then 4 times 2 is 8, so this will give us a negative 8. So negatives are really important when we work with exponents because they tell you um, whether that negative is going to be important or not and whether your answer is going to be negative or positive and all those parentheses, like all that. It's, it's like this is where you really need to pay attention to the details because it can make a big difference on your answer. Okay, so now I've thrown in some more complicated things here. Now that we've gone through all the basic rules, um, these are all ones that you can do essentially in two steps. Um, you could do them in more steps if you wanted. So top left, I have negative 6 times negative 1 times negative 10. So I have three negative signs, and, and this is all multiplied, 
So three is an odd number, so my answer is going to be negative. So I know that I'm going to have negative. And then what I can do is do six times one and get that out of the way first. Six times one is six. And then I can have that 10 kind of off to the side. And then I can do six times 10, which is 60, so that I get a negative 60. So you could also do this in one step. You could just do six times one times 10, um, or you can write it multiple steps here. Top right, now I have four things multiplied together. And there are four negative signs. So four negative signs, that's even, which means my answer is going to be positive. Oops. Just drop my stylus. So my answer is going to be positive. And if we did this multiplication, if we split it up into two separate sections, that can help you see that. So like if I multiply the first two numbers together, I have a negative and a negative, and those always give me a positive. And then 6 times 3, so that's 18. Now if I do the last two numbers, I have two negatives, which give me a positive. And then 1 times 5 is 5. So now I have 18 times 5. And you can see, well, that's going to give me a positive number. So that one I did on my calculator, and that gives me 90. Now, um, bottom left, I have 150 divided by negative 15 divided by negative 2. So we have two negative signs, so we're going to get a positive answer in the end. And you can just check yourself. Now, when we're doing division, we always have to work left to right. So to do this in two steps, I'm going to first do 150 divided by negative 15. So if I look at just those two numbers, I have a positive and a negative, so I'm going to get a negative. And then 150 divided by 15 is 10. So now I have negative 10 divided by negative 2. So now I do my division, and I have two negative signs, so I'm going to get a positive. And then 10 divided by 2 is 5. So I end up with a positive 5, which matches our rule. We had an even number of negative signs in the original problem, so our answer is positive. Now bottom right, I have three negative signs. That's odd, so I'm going to end up with a negative answer in the end. So I'm going to do this again in two steps. I'm going to first do the negative 12 divided by negative 6. So a negative and a negative, I'm going to get a positive. And 12 divided by 6 is 2. So I have 2, and then I still have to divide by negative 2. So I have a positive and a negative, so I'm going to get a negative answer. And then 2 divided by 2 is 1. So I end up with a negative 1. And that negative answer matches what I said at the very beginning that I had three negative signs, so I should end up with a negative. So it's just a way to check yourself to make sure you have the right sign. Are there any questions on any of those four? Not yet. Nothing here. Good. <laughs> I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. OK, these are my last two. And in these two, I am mixing multiplication and division. So when you, multi when you mix multiplication and division, you always have to go left to right. But the rules are the same. So the first one, I have two negative signs. So I should end up with a positive answer in the end. So I'm going to first take the first one. I'm going to take the first one. I'm going to do negative 6 times 7. So a negative and a positive, I'm going to get a negative answer. And then 6 times 7 is 42. And then I'm going to just copy down the dividing by negative 2. Now I have a negative and a negative, so that will give me a positive. 
And then 42 divided by 2 is 21. So here we end up with a positive 21. Now on the right, I have one negative sign, so I should end up with a negative answer. I'm going to first do the 10 divided by negative 2. So I have a positive and a negative, which means I'm going to have a negative here. And 10 divided by 2 is 5, so I get a negative 5. And then I'm going to write my times 3. Now I have a negative and a positive, which is going to give me a negative. And 5 times 3 is 15. So I end up with a negative 15 for the answer there. Any questions with those two? Not from me. All right. That's all I have. Do you guys have any questions in general? Mm, I don't think so. Can that okay. include general education about the lectures and attendance? Sure. Why not? <laughs> okay. So I'm doing online school or kind of around my work schedule. So mm -hmm. is there any points for attending the lectures and can I watch them later if I miss one? Great question. So you don't get points for attending. They're just beneficial, but you can watch them later. I record them. So I'm like recording this one right now. Um, it usually takes a while to process the video. So evening ones, I usually don't necessarily get posted until the next morning. Um, but if it's like, if I do one during the day, I usually can get those out within a couple of hours. So um, if you are unable to attend, you can always review the the recording, so you're not required to attend. Um, it's totally optional, but I do try to, you know, change up the time in the day so everybody, because I know some people work nights, some people work days, so I'm just trying to, you know, I want to have a variety of times available. Right. Um, you know, some people love to attend these, and some of these are like, I'm going online, I don't want to have to sit in <laughs> live, so <laughs> that's why it's not required. It's, you know, if you find it beneficial and you can attend, awesome. If not, well, you got the recording. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Do you guys have any other questions? I don't. Okay. I don't think so. All right. Well, in the classroom, um, I also, like in my live session thing, I've got videos on adding and subtracting with negatives. I've got fractions, and I have order of operations. So um, I'm sure once you start watching those, all of this stuff will start to come together too, if you you know, or you may come up with new questions. You're like, oh, what happens in this case? So <laughs> if you do, you can you can let me know. Okay, fair enough. All right. So all right, to exit out of here, yeah, you're welcome. To exit out, you could just close your browser. You don't have to like do anything else. Um, okay. Otherwise, there is like on the left if you hit the little three horizontal you can do leave session but i usually just close the browser so okay thank you you're welcome i will talk to you guys again sometime okay <laughs> have a great evening you too, you too.